<laughs> well, good for the introduction, Megan. And I welcome all of you here present today and all of you online. Um, and I would like to just welcome the fullness of each one of you here present. The parts of you that you're willing to share with us um, openly and the parts of you that you keep hidden and don't share with the public um, for whatever reason that may be. I welcome the entirety of your presence. So recently, within our lexicon, there has become this term that gets thrown around a lot, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, people are trying to shift that to PTSI, uh, post-traumatic stress uh, injury. Um, and I'll kind of lead into why that is. Uh, the great thing about PTSD and naming it is it does allow people to get treatment for the issues that they are facing, the hurt that they have experienced, and really start moving on and be becoming who they can be, the fullness of who they are. The problem with PTSD is it is a clinical diagnosis. And most people aren't psychologists or psychiatrists. That means we can't diagnose PTSD. We cannot legally work through PTSD with patients. We can accompany people on their journey, but it is not our job or our place work within the scope of PTSD, as much as pastors want to think that they should. <laughs> <laughs> but there is recently within theological uh, dialogue, and actually within the last couple months, the Navy and the Marine Corps recognizing a new term that is similar, but not entirely the same to PTSD, and that's moral injury. So I want to read a quick definition of moral injury uh, by Dr. Latini. Moral injury occurs when soldiers' core moral beliefs are shattered, and in evaluating their behavior negatively, they feel they no longer live in a reliable, meaningful world. They can no longer be regarded as decent human beings. Ouch. The actions that our soldiers have done that violates their core beliefs hurt them, not only in that moment, but when they come home. And moral injury can happen not only to our soldiers, but to anyone who's gone through a traumatic experience. But I am going to focus primarily on soldiers, because that's the area and scope that I have done the most study on. When, you, when a person experiences moral injury, their entire inner being, their self, is shattered. It is not something that you can say you're forgiven for. Move on. It's not something you can look to someone and say, well, you just need to get over it. Their being, their self-worth, is gone. They no longer feel that they are worth anything. That they have a reason for living. And unfortunately, a lot of our soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen regularly take their lives because of the effects of PTSD and the effects of moral injury. So what do we do as faith communities to respond to this crisis? This crisis of moral injury. We are the moral experts, right? The church is the moral experts, that's what I get told at least. <laughs> what do we do to respond? Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, we try to create rituals to say, you're forgiven. And that works really well for ex people experiencing guilt. We often conflate the two terms, guilt and shame, together. And they are very distinct. Guilt focuses on an action, on a specific thing done. I can feel guilty because I yelled at someone earlier today. Or I can feel guilty because I walked out of Walgreens with an extra battery. I don't know. Um, I feel guilty because of that specific action. And someone can say, you're forgiven for that action. And I can carry on my life. Shame is when a person feels bad and feels shame about who they are as a person. 
It is their inner being that is damaged and is hurting. Once again, these rituals, while can help progress in this process of healing, will not be the end solution. And that's about all I've seen the church do. It's here, let me forgive you. Mm. Let's move on. Or we tell them, well, Christ has redeemed you, so you're redeemable. But what they hear is what leads up to that, that original sin, that bondage of the will, that whole point that says we are not redeemable in and of ourselves. We are broken people. That needs an external savior and being to redeem us, which works great in theological language and in theological discourse, but when we are working with people who already feel that they have no self-worth, to tell them you don't is not helpful. And I'm not here to create, tell you what to do or have answers. There is not one solution for dealing with moral injury. What I can do is say that we need to start treating people as people. The fullness of who they are, the parts that they're willing to share with you, and the parts that they aren't. Everyone has things that we're willing to share and things we're not. Things that we're, things that we're ashamed about. We all are in that same boat. Just for some people, it may prevent them from doing, you know, walking down the street, doing things that you would do in your everyday life. We need to start talking to them as human beings, welcoming them as friends, as neighbors, as brothers and sisters. We need to stop reducing people to the uniform that they wear. As great as it is to thank someone for their service, or to thank them for their sacrifice. When that is what all you hear repeatedly, all of a sudden you get pulled back and your identity becomes the clothing that you wear, not the person that you are. If we take the time to actually get to know people, to get to know our returning veterans, and ask them, hi, how are you doing? What did you have for breakfast? Treat them like we would treat anyone and everyone else. It is one step in the right direction of stopping this culture of perpetuating shame, of telling people that they're worthless, that because you fought in a war, that you didn't start, but you did volunteer to put on a uniform for our country. When we stop shaming people and adding to their shame, there may become something. So, I would ask all of you, present here today and online, to take the time to get to know people. When you have returning veterans, you can thank them for their sacrifice, their service. That is great. But also add, how are you doing today? <laughs> How, is your kid? How are your kids? How's your family? Ask them out to lunch. Treat them like a person. Help them find themselves. That's kind of what I have. Yay! Questions, but are there any questions? Oh, you don't like questions? No, I'm saying as a group, we haven't had questions. Oh, yeah. But are there any questions? Do you want questions? You mentioned. Uh, PTSD and PTSI, but I don't think you did for it Oh, post, I don't think I actually did, even though I said I was going to. Yeah. Post-traumatic stress injury versus post-traumatic stress disorder. So once you label something a disorder, all of a sudden it has to be dealt with by a medical professional. Mm -hmm. To label something as post-traumatic stress injury, it broadens the scope of who can work with them. It's saying it's an injury, kind of like moral injury. Uh, to where you don't have to have a certification to work with people on these issues. It's not a clinical diagnosis anymore. But I don't know it's the same. It's the same, same symptoms, same cause, same effects. It's just trying to take it out of the medical world and allow um, a broader scope of people to work with them um, and make it where it's not a diagnosis. Mm. So you're not 
So you're not being diagnosed with cancer, you're just... Um, I mean, that's kind of the parallel that people have to come up with, is you're being diagnosed with PTSD, you're being diagnosed with cancer. It's a diagnosis from the medical field. Um, as opposed to saying, well, this is something that you're injured, you can find repair from. You can never be healed fully or restored, but you can find repair. Uh, I actually had lunch with Dr. Latini one time, and she was talking about helping uh, soldiers uh, repair themselves and find repair. She was challenged on this top, or idea of being repaired. Her um, book was actually called Soul Repair. And she was saying that it is not as if you're going to become uh, or be made new again, but it's like the 1950s uh, dishwasher or washing machine or whatever appliance you want to imagine that you could go and fix yourself back then because that's how they make stuff. Uh, and it wasn't ever going to be the same, but it was able to function again. But there was changes in it. Um, so taking out of this diagnosis you have to be cured from to something that you can be repaired and a journey through, I think, is a big shift. Are there a lot of soldiers using this language and veterans using this language, is there, or is it primary academic right now? Uh, right now it's primarily academic. Um, moral injury and injury like type language has really been in the pastoral care uh, field for a while, um, probably in the last 10 years it's been thrown around. Literally within the last, I think, three months, the US Navy and US Marine Corps have recognized the term and idea of moral injury and are uh, embarking on a journey and study on how moral injury can be uh, looked at in conjunction to PTSD as a parallel track. Um, so there is growth in this, but it's still a very, very new field. Um, we still want to keep it clinical because it's easier to deal with. We don't have to deal with it, those professionals have to. As soon as it becomes something that we're all invited and challenged to participate in, there becomes a sharing. And as I asked you to share with people earlier, talk to them, unfortunately and fortunately, we take on part of their wounds. When you're willing to open up and share, and someone else is willing to open up and share, those wounds that they've experienced also get shared with you, and you personally become wounded. It sucks. It hurts. But it is a corporate social sin that we can embark on in these wars. And the only way that we're going to find true healing is through corporate social dialogue mm -hmm. and sharing in that experience. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Yeah.